Our scripture today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to marry, but since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all men were as I am, but each one has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and to the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I am, but if they cannot control themselves, they should marry for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Before we look specifically at these nine verses, I want to share with you three errors that are commonly practiced regarding a passage like 1 Corinthians chapter 7. One error that is practiced is to avoid such a subject altogether. That is the error of being silent when the Bible clearly speaks on a matter. With C.S. Lewis, I noted last week, that said when the devil sends error into the world, he always sends it in pairs of two opposite extremes. One way that he sends error into the world in regard to sexual matters is to focus one's attention so dominantly on them that they're unable to function on any, uh, and to think of anything else. Another error uh, on the other side, equally as bad, is to act as though God did not create us with bodies to be silent when the word speaks. I have uh, learned uh, several years ago that uh, one of the advantages to expository preaching is that ultimately by preaching systematically through the scripture, the whole counsel of God is declared to the whole people of God. When I first came as pastor several years ago, after I'd been at the church for a number of months, I felt the Lord leading me to preach from the book of Leviticus. And I fought that very strongly for two reasons. And some of you are aware of this. So one reason what, why I fought that was that there have been more Bible reading resolutions break down in the wilderness of Leviticus than perhaps any other portion of Scripture. And I thought, Lord, if I start out preaching through Leviticus in a few months, everybody's going to be gone away. And the second thing was uh, I honestly did not know how to handle Leviticus 15 from the pulpit didn't know how to read it from the pulpit, let alone preach from it, because it has to do with sensitive bodily matters, such as bodily discharges of all kinds. And I remember remonstrating with the Lord about the direction that I felt for going through Leviticus, and the Lord gave me two answers. Uh, one was, all scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for teaching, for training in righteousness, for correction. And that surely, therefore, God intended the book of Leviticus to be profitable for teaching, for practical everyday living today. Second thing which he, in effect, said to me was, I'm not going to show you how to treat Leviticus 15 until you're there, so I won't give you an answer in advance. Now, God doesn't speak to me audibly, but these were impressions on my heart. When you get there, you'll know how. So I started out in Leviticus with fear and trembling, not knowing what to do when I came to Leviticus 15. Remember the Monday morning, I opened my Bible to Leviticus 15. That Sunday, Leviticus 14 had been preached from, and I thought, as I start the week, usually on Monday, trying to begin doing the research for the sermon the succeeding Sunday, but Lord, what are you going to now show me from Leviticus 15? And the Lord gave me a, an approach to that scripture, which has been since then one of my, my favorite understandings of the nature of God. The message which the Lord gave me was titled, A Very Personal God. And it went along the line something like this. You think God is remote. You think he's way up in the heaven somewhere, that he doesn't know you, that he, uh, he doesn't possibly understand what you're going through. Listen, read Leviticus 15. He knows you rather well. After all, he is the engineer. He's the designing engineer. He knows every facet of our personality, of our physical framework. Nothing is unknown to him. The word, therefore, speaks very clearly about matters which perhaps out of a sense of propriety, we might refrain from talking about the fact that Scripture speaks about these matters, though, ought to correct a false sense 
of propriety. Paul has actually been sent a letter, sent a letter by the Corinthians, and he now begins to answer questions which they have raised in their letter. First six chapters he deals with concerns that are on his heart that they haven't asked him about. But whenever he uses now that phrase in Corinthians, now concerning, it's in response to a letter that he has been written. Persons have asked him questions about uh, sex and about marriage. So chapter 7 answers that question. Chapter 8, persons have asked him questions about food offered to idols, and he answers that question there. Chapter 12, others have asked him questions about spiritual gifts, he answers that question. Chapter 16, some ask about the collection for the saints, and he answers that question. Paul is not at all, in chapter 7, hesitant to openly share an answer regarding sex and marriage with the entire congregation, a mixed multitude of men and women, of young people, and of children. Therefore, Scripture is not silent on matters which sometimes we might be. A second thing that I think we ought to realize in looking at a passage like 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is the false idea of believing that sexual freedom is Satan's idea. We have been sold a good a bill of goods by the world today that real freedom comes in throwing aside the restraint that God has established or that real freedom is found outside of marriage. But we recognize in going back to the scripture, Genesis chapter 1 verse 31 and Genesis chapter 2 verse 25, that God created man and woman, male and female, created he them, and he said it was good. And the original human family, Adam and Eve, are described as both being naked before God and not ashamed. God saw that among the joys that he would give to the human race would be the joy of sexual freedom. C.S. Lewis so beautifully puts things in his book, Screwtape Letters. I don't know if all of you have read Screwtape Letters. Certainly, if you are a Christian, I think a must-reading for every Christian ought to be to read Screwtape Letters. Screwtape is a senior tempter in hell who sends out letters of advice to a more junior tempter, his nephew Wormwood, on how to work on the human race, most specifically the particular person whom Wormwood has been assigned to. And one of the classic pieces of, of advice that Wormwood writes, or that Screwtape writes to Wormwood is as follows. Never forget that when we are dealing with any pleasure in its healthy and normal and satisfying form, we are, in a sense, on the enemy's, God's, ground. I know we have won many a soul through pleasure. All the same, it is his invention, not ours. He made the pleasures. All our research so far has not enabled us to produce one. All we can do is to encourage the human to take the pleasures which our enemy, God, has produced at times or in ways or in degrees which he has forbidden. The most part is that he has a very low opinion of marriage. He seems to here be saying, according to a surface reading of the passage, that the only reason to, to, not, or the only reason to get married is if you don't have self-control. One liberal Protestant writer had said something like this. It is regrettable that Paul, the bachelor, should have ignored so completely all other aspects of marriage and should have written as if marriage were little more than legalized cohabitation. As to the first charge that Paul is a bachelor, it may very well be that he was a bachelor all of his life. It may very well be that Paul, at the time of the writing of Corinthians, is simply now unmarried, but at one time he had been married. It's very possible, according to Acts 26.10, that Paul were a member of the Sanhedrin. He says he cast his vote against Christians that were sentenced to death. We know that casting votes was a function of people that belonged to the Sanhedrin. To be a member of the Sanhedrin, you had to be married. If Paul were a member of the Sanhedrin, then at one time he would have been married. It may have been that he was married and his wife died. It may have been even that his wife repudiated him when he became a Christian. Philippians chapter 3.8, Paul says that he suffered for Christ's sake the loss of all things. We don't know whether he was married or not, but the fact that he is a bachelor doesn't disqualify him from speaking authoritatively as an apostle of Christ. After all, Jesus himself was a bachelor. As to the second charge that Paul has a low view of marriage, we must remember that in 1 Corinthians 7, he is not giving a treatise on the totality of marriage. Rather, he is responding to specific questions which have been raised within the Corinthian congregation. Questions like, for example, is it right for a person to get married? What part that sexual union have in a marriage relationship. There were those at Corinth who were saying it has no part at all. There ought to be simply spiritual or platonic marriages. Anything other than that is a, an affront against God. Paul is having to respond to this very specific thing. If you want to know his total view on marriage, then look at Ephesians chapter 5, where he compares the role of the husband and wife in marriage 
to the role of Christ in the church, the bride and the bridegroom. A tremendous, beautiful analogy. And you must remember, too, that Paul understood a great deal about love, as view of the fact, after all, under the guidance of the Spirit, he did write 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The view that he holds a low view of marriage can be put to rest as we seriously look at the passages before us today, which we'll do now. In these nine verses, Paul is giving counsel to married and unmarried persons. The first thing he is saying, it's important to note this, is that the Christian is free not to marry. He writes, Now, for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to marry. Or it's good for a woman not to marry. Now, what is the meaning of this, it's good not to marry? Does this mean that marriage is second best? Is Paul saying it's better not to marry, but if you've got to go ahead and get married, take God's second best for your life and get married? I heard an amen. <laughs> no. What, what Paul is, is actually doing in that word good is not setting up a comparison. He is responding to a traditional viewpoint among some of the Jewish Christian believers of the Corinthian church which held that the single life was a lower state of life than the married life. We'll talk about more about this in just a moment. But he's saying, no, that's not true at all. It is good, that is, it is proper, it is all right, it's permissible, it's okay for a person to remain single. There's no onus uh, that can be put upon a single person for remaining single. The King James has the phrase, it's good for a man not to touch a woman, and some have really bent that phrase out by saying you shouldn't even shake hands or touch on the shoulder or anything like that. Paul uh, means something deeper by that as is in the modern translation, it's good for a man not to marry. What Paul is doing in this passage is making an affirmation. The single person is not a, quote, spare, end quote. I think back to the, my, some of my earlier years in the church, and there was in the, one of the churches that I was a part of a class for young married and for single adults who were through college but were not yet married. Church hardly knew what to do with such a class of people, and so there was a class that was formed called Pairs and Spares. It being understood that if you were single, you were the spare, the half that was looking around for your other uncompleted half. And the viewpoint uh, sometimes has prevailed, if you have reached your late 20s and you aren't yet married, there must be something drastically wrong with you. That was the Jewish view of Paul's day. Marriage was seen as a duty, so much so that if a man had not married by the age of 20, he was considered by many rabbis to have sinned. And one, one rabbi said, and I quote, he who has no wife is no man. Paul, in this passage, puts down the false superiority of the married person who looks down upon the unmarried person as being some lesser creature. He says, not at all, not at all. It is good for a person, a man or a woman, not to marry. There's no sin attached to that at all at all. You can be a complete person and be a single person. That is a critical affirmation. By the way, it also ought to be noted parenthetically here that Paul nowhere tells unmarried women that they, in the event they don't get married, they need a, quote, covering, some male who will be the, quote, covering for them. Without getting into the whole realm of this subject, it should be noted that the word covering in its original meaning means to atone. The Hebrew word atone means to cover, and the only one who can ever really cover us is Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross. Of course, outside of that, we're called appropriate and proper relationships uh, among one another, but the concept of a single woman needing to be covered by someone else is simply an idea that is foreign to the Scripture. What else here is Paul saying? He's saying, first of all, the Christian is free not to marry. The second thing he is saying, an important thing is, that whether or not you marry should depend upon the gift that you have received from God. Look with me for a moment at verse 7. I wish that all men, that is all people, were as I am, but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Paul recognizes something called a charisma, a spiritual gift. You've heard the word charisma or charismatic movement. We often think of charismatic as something related to speaking in tongues or prophesying or healing or, or the like. Paul uses that same word charisma, which in the New Testament is never used to describe the gift of one person to another, but is always used to describe the gift of God to his people. It's a gift of grace. It's a gift of a superior to an inferior. Paul uses that same word charisma and says, you have received a charisma. You have received the charisma of being single, 
or you have received the charisma of being married. In either event, though, you are charismatic. He, what Paul is saying here is that the desire to marry and to have sexual union is a gift of God's grace. On the other hand, the desire to remain single so as to have more time and mobility to serve the Lord's work is also a gift of God's grace. And God gives his gift as he will. Some have been given this gift and some have been given that. How then do you know which gift you have? Paul is simply saying, are you continually tempted by sexual immorality? Do you find that in your life there is a drive which leads you to want to be married so very, very deeply that there's no way that you can lay aside that drive? What he is saying is that there should therefore be on your part the recognition that God has put a grace in your life, a special grace in your life, which is meant to be completed and fulfilled by marriage. Paul does not beat people over the head with guilt who have this strong desire. He does not say to them, exercise more control, you've sinned, or something like that. He says, no, God made you this way, and the normal channel, therefore, that God wants you to take is to be married. Phillips translates chapter 7, verse 9 very expressively, and I think rightly when he says, I think it is far better for those to be married than to be tortured by unsatisfied desire. I sometimes like to go back to the old commentators to find out what people were saying three or four hundred years ago. It's a little bit uh, different than the modern writers. One such a writer, Matthew Henry, in his commentary on this passage, has a fascinating, perceptive spiritual comment on 7.9. He says, note, persons expose themselves to great danger by attempting to perform what is above their strength, and at the same time not bound upon them by any law of God. If they abstain from lawful enjoyments, they may be ensnared into unlawful ones. The remedies God has provided against sinful inclinations are certainly best. In other words, what Paul and what Matthew Henry are saying here is that no person should deliberately try to lead a way of life which is going to surround them by temptations greater than their power to deal with. Paul, on the other hand, does not say that a spouse should simply be chosen to legalize cohabitation. What he is saying to us is, recognize your gift from God. Strong desire for marriage is God's gift to you. But on the other hand, Paul does not then go out and say, find the first person available and marry them. Nor does he say, put an ad in the Christian yellow pages. <laughs> to paraphrase another scripture, lay hands on no one suddenly. <laughs> we are to test out the will of God by prayer, by observation of another person's life, by the inward prompting of the Spirit. Take time. It's the most important decision outside of accepting Christ into your life that you will ever make in life if you are going to be married. That will be the most important decision outside of Christ. If you're not going to be married, that obviously will not be an important decision. There will be other things that God will put before you to choose. But in such a situation, we need to sanctify it by prayer, by observation of the life of the person that we're marrying, to test out whether this is of the Lord or not, and by the inward prompting of the Spirit. It is good counsel for young people to begin praying now for the Lord to have his will in your life for a life partner. If you sense in your life that God has placed in you the gift of wanting to be married, the gift of marriage, then by all means begin asking the Lord to direct you. I thought back as I prepared this message to the days of my being a teenager, and I remember I used to think on occasion, I wonder what she's doing today. You know, I didn't know who she was. She might be living in a city, might be living on a farm, and would I meet her today? Well, obviously, as I, as I look back, that, that kind of thing is, a, is exactly what Paul is saying about a gift from God. I knew that I wanted to be married. I never had a desire for the single life and don't have a desire today for the single life, which my wife is glad to hear. No, not really. I can remember, you know, on sermons on the Lord's return, the only one thing wrong with sermons on the Lord's return, that it might, if the Lord came back too quick, I might not meet this girl that I had wanted to marry. And we need to remember that the same apostle who wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 7 also wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And that we ought to resist those who unfairly twist this scripture, especially verse 9, to say Paul is in favor 
of, of uh, simply selecting a person on the basis of a need in your own life. It's not the case what he's saying at all. He's saying there's a special gift, and that gift then leads you to begin to search for the person that God is calling you to. By the way, Paul not only uh, does not say that a spouse should be chosen simply to legalize cohabitation, but he also does not say that all persons who remain single have a good reason. Not necessarily all single persons are there because they have the charisma of singlehood. Some are single because they may dread responsibility. Others are single because they prefer casual relationships. Some are single because they are selfish. Others because they like the freedom of the single life. Others because they are yet waiting God's time to reveal to them who their partner is going to be. Paul positively and expressively declines to judge others by himself or himself by others. That's the meaning of uh, verse 6. I say this by way of concession. That is, it's not a command to marry or to stay single. He will not judge anyone else by himself nor let anyone else judge him for what he's doing. Every person must do what is best for themselves according to their charisma, according to the gift of grace. Then in this passage, Paul deals with another topic, and that is the topic that marriage brings responsibility, verses 2 through 5. He says that it, first of all, brings the responsibility of fidelity. Now, since there is so much immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. He is in this passage, therefore, ruling out such things as polygamy, one husband, many wives. He's ruling out in some cultures, like the culture my parents were missionaries in, in Tibet, practice polyandry, which is one wife, many husbands. He is ruling out adultery. He is saying there is a responsibility of fidelity and total loyalty to one another. The second thing that he is saying about the responsibilities of marriage are that there is a responsibility of a debt due, verses 3 through 5. There were evidently some at Corinth who felt that marriage should be simply spiritual and not physical, that it should be platonic. Paul counters this by saying in verse 3, that the husband owes a debt to his wife and the wife to the husband. A debt is the actual word that is employed. By the way, Paul here, and and Paul has been accused of all kinds of things, including being a woman hater and male dominance and superiority and all these kinds of things. It ought to be noted here that in verse 3, he regards the obligation as a two-way street, enjoyment as a two-way street, The husband owes a debt to his wife, and the wife owes a debt to her husband. In verse 4, Paul says the wife does not have power or authority over her own body, but her husband. Likewise, the same applies to the husband. And in verse 5, he says, do not steal from one another. It's a very precise term. Do not steal or do not defraud from one another, except by, and the word he uses in the Greek is symphony, except by agreement. A symphony is something where the notes are resonating together in a, in a chorus that has has beauty of of agreement. Paul in this passage is not saying to a married couple, demand your rights from one another. Instead, what he is saying to a married couple is meet your responsibilities one to another. These are important responsibilities. God created responsibilities, and therefore they are to be met. Some conclusions can be drawn from this responsibility of a debt due. One very important conclusion is that Paul bases the physical relationship of husband and wife on a basis other than simply having children or procreation. He bases it upon mutual dependence for fulfillment. And I think this is an important point for those in our day or in past days who have taught that every act of marriage between husband and wife should be with the intent of bearing a child in order for that union to have God's blessing that is precisely absent here from Paul's teaching and instead he treats marital union as an obligation that is due. The second thing that flows as a conclusion is that the husband or the wife is not free to use affection as a means of reward or punishment to the other partner. Perhaps on a scale of 1 to 10 of the most common problems in a marriage relationship, certainly the use of affection as a means of reward or punishment would rank right at the top of the list. Paul indicates that the giving of marital affection must not spring from a spirit which says, I'll do you a favor but must spring from the gentle humility of grace which says, I have this responsibility, I owe you this debt. The third thing that Paul is saying here about sexuality within marriage is that it is not a necessary evil to be put up with or tolerated, but it is indeed a gift from God, a special gift of God's grace. 
The Song of Solomon, of course, celebrates this, doesn't it? For many years, Christians look at the Song of Solomon, and, which is, to me, a song of the joy of marital love. Looked at that and have been somewhat queasy about it and said, well, this must not really refer to an honest love between a husband and wife. Rather, it must simply refer to the love of Christ for his church. And therefore, the Song of Solomon has been allegorized out of its original meaning. Well, granted, where there is a healthy relationship between husband and wife, it models the healthy relationship Christ has to his church. And in that sense, therefore, Song of Solomon is a legitimate analogy of the love Christ has for his bride, us, the church. At the same time, though, God chose within the scripture to place a hymn, a poem of marriage celebration to indicate his stamp of approval upon the gift which he himself has created. Sexuality, therefore, within marriage is a gift of God freely given to us by God, given freely to one another by one's partner, a gift of grace. Paul then goes on to say, as another logical outcome, that abstaining from marital affection is subject to three conditions. It must be by mutual agreement, cannot be unilateral, where one person uh, feels one way and another person feels another way, but rather it must be by mutual agreement. It must be, abstinence must be for a good cause, such as prayer, or maybe in other cases we could add such things as sickness or separation because of the job or military uh, leave or something like that. And Paul says again, it must be temporary. Failure to abide by these three conditions which Paul sets down may result in one or both of the marriage partners having to go through extraordinary and unnecessary agony in temptation. Thus Paul is saying that abstaining from a relationship in marriage is both selfish and it is dangerous and gives apostolic counsel against it. Now how do we take all of this now and apply it in our lives whether we are married or single? Well, many things have found their way by application simply by looking at the text, but I share with you this closing illustration. In our home, there is on, in one room, there is a little dial on the wall which holds two things in it, a thermometer and a thermostat. Some homes, these two instruments are separated one from another. We all know what the thermometer is for. The thermometer is to simply report back to you the temperature that is in the room. If the temperature is in the room, it's very warm, the thermometer will tell you, hey, heading up into the higher 70s. If the temperature is very cold, the thermometer will tell you, look, heading low into the 60s. The thermometer simply reads back to you the existing temperature that is there. Not so with the thermostat, however. The thermostat is a mechanism whereby you change the temperature. And what is significant about the thermostat is that the thermostat needle, if you're going to change the temperature, must always move before the temperature itself changes. That is, if the room temperature is 70 degrees and you want it to be 74, you've got to turn the thermostat to 74 and then wait for a while for the temperature, the thermometer, to actually show the room is at 74. This, to me, is a critical analogy as it relates both to marriage and as it relates to our walk with God. You cannot successfully maintain a relationship if it is on a thermometer kind of relationship. Where if things are great, with you, then things are great with me in return toward you. And if things are icy with you, then they're icy with me. I will simply feed back the emotional temperature that you are giving to me. That is death in a human relationship. I don't know if it's supported by a law of science or not, but, uh, but there maybe is a law of thermonuclear dy dy dynamics somewhere which, where things get, if you let them go unattended, get colder and colder. I don't know, but that, be that as it may. You cannot respond temperature to temperature. What Paul is saying in this beautiful model of 1 Corinthians chapter 17 is that there must be a willingness, in effect, to live thermostatically, to respond not as has you have been responded to if you have not been responded to in the way that you want to be responded to, but instead to respond by setting the thermostat of your response at a level which is significantly higher than the temperature of the response you've been getting. And that by living thermostatically, one gives oneself and one spouse the opportunity for change. Now, when you look at how God loves us, then this illustration becomes so beautiful, a revelation of God's grace, because God does not love us like a thermometer. When I am really on fire for the Lord, the Lord doesn't look back and say, hey, George Wood down there is doing pretty good today. I think I'll love him more. Or when I'm really 
really, as the kids may say, bombing out, whatever, and having a real grubby day. And I'm arguing with God about what I'm doing in life. God doesn't say, Wood's got problems today. Let's turn the temperature of the love down. Let's send him a few snakes. Let's not send him any grace today. Now, if God loved us like a thermometer, we'd be in a lot of trouble. But he loves us thermostatically. He sets the degree of his love at a level, in fact, we'll maybe even never come up to until we see him face to face. That he has purposed to love us in spite of, in the original instance, when we were yet in sin, Christ loved us. We were yet in sin, Christ died for us. That is love that is not reciprocal love, setting the temperature at the same degree that you're getting, but it's love that is thermostatic. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. Look at the manner of love that God has given to us. He therefore loves us in a degree which wins our love. He doesn't say, love me a little bit more and I'll love you a little bit more and gradually we'll get this thing worked out where we'll let our temperatures both rise at the same time. He starts with grace as an unconditional act of grace. He loves us completely, wholly, no matter what our feelings may tell us at times and what false views of Scripture may tell us at times, yet the fact remains, God so loved you, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shouldn't perish but have everlasting life. The love of God for you is fantastic. God has set his love at a level which then allows you the liberty to begin to respond to. But he doesn't alter that love. Hosea in the Old Testament is an incredible model of this because Hosea is a story between a husband and a wife and God does not tell Hosea to love his wife like a thermometer. He says to Hosea that he must love his wife like a thermostat. He must be faithful and loving to his wife even when she has been unfaithful and unloving to him. And then God turns right around and uses that as a model of his own love for his people. How shall I forget you? How shall I cast you off? A beautiful model of love. May God help us in our interpersonal relationships to remember that part of living successfully for the Lord and part of success in marriage is living by paying attention to the thermostat rather than to the thermometer. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your word which addresses us so very clearly and specifically regarding the issues in life that we face. We do thank you, Lord, that there is no temptation that we face that is unknown to you, that catches you by surprise, and you have provided with every testing point also a way of escape. We want to thank you as individual persons who bow before you now for the special gifts of grace you've placed in our life. We honor you and thank you for the gift of singleness and the gift of marriage. Both come from you. And we honor and recognize you in the giving of this gift. We pray that in the exercise of our gift that you have given, that there will be the freedom to develop that gift in your way, in your time. That we will not violate the gift in such a way that it ceases to bring us joy or freedom. Lord, we pray especially for the young people and others in this congregation who sense in their own life a call to being married, but have not yet come to that moment in life where they have made that choice or that decision. How beautiful your word is, which tells us to acknowledge you in all our ways, and you will direct our path. If you have given us a gift, Lord, then you also will, in your way and in your time, lead us to the enjoyment of that gift. We acknowledge your direction in that area of our life. We bring before you also, Lord Jesus, every marriage within this church family. And we ask that that marriage would be what you have intended it to be, that it would know the joy that you, the Creator God, have given, that in all areas of the marital life, physically and spiritually and friendship-wise, there might be a real growing together in grace and in the love that belongs to us as your children and that is in Christ Jesus. Now, Lord, we look to you for the application of these words as we live out our life in everyday terms through the week, through the days to come. May your word sustain us. May it always be food for our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.